Hello, Ms. Benitez. Thank you so much for joining in the Hyperloop. Absolutely. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me on this talk. Well, you've published a really interesting article um, about intellectual property and Hyperloop and technology transfer, and you're a veteran of the Hyperloop pod competition. Um, how, how did this all come together, and, and how did you first you know, learn about Hyperloop? So in 2016, I got involved with the Hyperloop group at the University of Texas. I was on a team called Texas Waterloop, and I worked as a, like a power designer to help oh, cool. sort of be the liaison between the mechanical side and the electrical side. And after developing and working with the team, I learned a lot about student groups and working with the university to get funding, mm -hmm. as well as getting funding outside of the team. And I worked with them for two years. And so I took this background. I already had an interest in them. And although I, I ended my time with the team, I still have that background and that like interest of keeping up with all the teams and seeing what's happening. And an easy way to do that is with my current industry. I work in the intellectual property sphere in Austin, Texas, and mostly around the United States. There's a lot of developments and a lot of um, big players when it comes to these sort of financial issues of mm -hmm. property. And now that teams are finally getting involved, it's becoming, it's picking up and it's going to become a bigger news in the coming years. Yeah. And, and when you say like intellectual property, and can you just define what technology transfer is uh, to you? Sure. Yeah. Okay, so intellectual property is an asset, and it's something that the teams invest in and their like business partners want to invest in. And let's mm -hmm. say that the university helps these teams, um, it helps these teams own this property. It's mm -hmm. the university's property, and it's like owning a house. And when you want to sell this house to other people, then they'll come and they'll want to get it. Yeah. And so it's value that they can uh, sell. And, and what's kind of happening um, in the intellectual property sphere in general um, with all these, you know, with startups or, you know, established companies? Uh, that's a great question because it's actually blown up in the last few hmm. years. The Alice versus CLS Bank case was instrumental to changing the patent litigation landscape. Alice Bank used an escrow system and had a patent for this process. CLS Bank was also practicing the escrow system because it's been a financial system or basic concept for hundreds of years. So CLS challenged the eligibility of Alice's patents. And finally, the court ruled that since the escrow system is a basic financial concept, adding a computer or adding software does not make it more inventive. So the ruling isn't that software isn't patentable. Just that basic abstract ideas aren't more eligible just because there's software for them now. This has made some waves in the industry where some patents that were filed before the case are not eligible anymore. And this has also set the bar to new applicants to prove that their invention is not an abstract idea made possible through a computer. Hyperloop applicants will have to prove that their differences are inventive today's train systems and that they aren't just adding new software. Once they have a patent for the invention, it typically lasts 20 years. Yeah, so now patents hmm. are being challenged all the time. Hmm. And so um, some of those patents still hold weight. And so there's just a slew of litigation coming through where we have to decide now what warrants a patent and is this legitimate? And mm -hmm. if it is, then it's like groundbreaking and it'll hold its um, weight for 20 years that it's wow. legitimate. Hmm. So. Basically, any groups that are putting out patents now, they're going to be legitimate for 20 years, which is a long time. And then that's why it's um, fascinating to me that some of these groups have been able to put forward that, that documentation so that they have those rights. And I'm excited <laughs> to see where that goes and who is going to come out with the first working um, Hyperloop. Yeah. And, you know, in your article... Um you really mention a lot of different groups, um, three or four, uh, that are each taking kind of a different track in um, commercializing Hyperloop technology. Um, 
but why why should you know somebody file for intellectual property and why would that be important so why should someone file is if they want to bar out any competition like mm -hmm. if you are an inventor and you are the first to make something you don't want to put out like let's say you made a chair and you showed it to the world and now there's five other companies making chairs and Walmart heard about your chair and now they're definitely making it at a oh. cheaper price than you. That would be terrible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, and so you could do that and you could keep it and be the only person um, that can sell it. What a patent means is not that you have the rights to sell it. It just means that no one else can sell it where you put that patent in mm. place. Oh, okay. So it's kind of like, a red line for the people, not just a right to sell, but a right to stop others. Mm. So it's uh, kind of proactive and reactive at the same time. <laughs> right. Oh, that's cool. And, you know, there's not, that's why I think this is interesting. It's because it's a sort of like a philosophical question of do I want to stop others mm. or do I want to work with others, which is what some other groups have chosen to do and mm. decided not to file and to not only not file, but put everything on the internet <laughs> and to ask for help. Like there's a, a Reddit group that just works together. So they, everything that they're doing is absolutely public. And then Hyperloop oh. Connected is public. Yeah. And, and you mentioned Hyperloop Connected, which is uh, put on by the Delft Hyperloop team. Um, how might that, you know, affect intellectual property or what they publish like free to, sure. to the internet? So there's this concept of prior art. Hmm. And if there's prior art of an invention, then they have, I think it's about up to a year to file that themselves and claim hmm. that property. But if they don't, and another group tries to claim a patent, if there's proof that someone else already came up with this design, mm -hmm. then they don't have the rights. Hmm. And so that's what's going to, that's what I think is interesting is that Delft Hyperloop, who is one of the best teams, is uh, foregoing, like, claiming any sort of property right and is saying, let's put all our invention online and work together to move faster towards the goal and mm -hmm. not worry about making money off of it. Because all, everything that they're putting together is just prior art all over the place. If there's anything inventive, because there might not be anything novel, there might be mm -hmm. no property there. But they're kind of, I don't think they're worried about that. And they definitely yeah. state on their about page, like, other companies keep everything under lock and key, but we want to find a solution. So mm. let's not worry about secrets. <laughs> Interesting. Um, and, it, you know, as we've kind of discussed about international groups, and it's kind of, it, this Hyperloop Development's international at the SpaceX pod competition teams, you know, the last couple of years, as you've seen, you know, uh, international teams do very well. Um, right. So if a group, you know, files for IP and, uh, you know, if a group filed in Germany, does that affect patents made by other teams in the U.S. or other groups? So the best thing that these groups can do is file at each country. Mm. And that's what kind of makes it difficult and what is like a obstacle because filing for patents is not cheap. It's a very expensive process uh, and it can take a, um, like a couple of years hmm. and so it kind of is a question of what's the best like plan of attack like what would be uh, the most strategic to file first in our own country and then file in the United States and then file elsewhere there's a question of do they still own that idea if they owned it first in another country would that be then their prior art that they have the rights to this invention mm -hmm. And, you know, it can, it can get a little complicated because right now we're, um, the United States is having some trouble with China. And so mm. it's the question of does, where is our intellectual property respected? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, um, it's always really fascinating, um, especially, you know, as you refer to in your, in your article about uh, collegiate hyperloop groups, like a lot of these startups, you know, start in the garage or in like the yeah. the college dorm room or something exactly um, or a university lab yeah that's tucked away yeah. in the corner and then can become so big mm -hmm. off yeah. of an inventive idea yeah um so overall you know what what have you learned 
you know, from working in Hyperloop or um, in your new role, um, looking at, you know, intellectual property, like what's, what's one of the main things that you've seen? One of the main yeah. things that I've seen is that student groups um, do depend on the university for support. Mm -hmm. For example, at the University of Texas, we were lucky that they gave us a space. They gave us a, a giant, um, sort of almost like a warehouse on their laboratory campus because oh, cool. UT actually has an entire other campus that's only laboratories, yeah. which is cool. And that they would give us um, like a platform to stand on and speak at events that were uh, hosted by UT so that we could get closer to funding mm -hmm. because in the end, funding is going to provide almost everything except yeah. our, the ideas and the man work. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so that's why I brought technology transfer into the talk because that's mm. something that I learned about now in my current role mm -hmm. on these in-house councils that work for the university to protect their students, protect their um, inventiveness, mm -hmm. and maybe even profit off of it mm. by selling these uh, these patents. Mm -hmm. and. That's what I think is cool that there's already been some litigation that's happening at universities are seeing the value of uh, keeping this property and and finding companies that are willing to mm -hmm. or need those patents themselves. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's something that the groups would find value in if they get more involved with the university to start documentation now, mm -hmm. because the last thing that these groups want to do is forget to file or forget to keep these things uh. secret. Because so often we want to show off. I know, uh, like, I think that's some of the background that I bring in is just like, we're students. We were, I was a student. You were a student. student. <laughs> um, we want to show the world, like, look what I made. This is awesome. Please fund us. Yeah. But then when you give away secrets, you might be risking future uh, property. Yeah. Oh. So there's a fine yeah. line. Like, talk to your investors, but don't make it public yeah interesting well um it's all it's all a very delicate dance <laughs> sometimes <laughs> um, yes, that's a good way to put it yeah so so how can people uh get in touch with you or learn more about um your company that you work for so i would say go to luminc.com that's l-u-m-e-n-c-i.com we're a technology patents consulting firm. So mm -hmm. we are a group of engineers who have these backgrounds and can investigate patents on behalf of companies or venture capitalists, people who are wanting to figure out the value and if there's a legitimate case there. Mm -hmm. And it's also just a, a good time to get involved in this sphere since yeah. the turn of the Alice case. Mm -hmm. Now software patents, some are invalid, some aren't. And things pick up, especially when big companies get involved, like Apple and their troubles with Qualcomm. And it, it can get very big and very drawn out, and it's exciting, an exciting time for technology as, as we yeah. progress. Yeah, interesting. Well, uh, thank you so much for joining in the Hyperloop, and you know, we look forward to uh, following next year's SpaceX pod competition, but also you know, the role that you've played in, in helping develop this new technology. So thanks so much. Yes. Thank you. Thanks. Have a good day. I'm yeah. very excited. And let's have a good year and let's see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep, indeed.